Today on The Topping Show, Bud Light is selling some of their beer brands. Bud Light sales are down about 26%. Is Bud Light censoring comments on other YouTube channels? A woman is fired for not working thanks to keystroke tracking technology. The ATF wants to ban private gun sales. Mike Pence finally qualifies for the upcoming Republican primary debate. Rumble will live stream Republican debate. Beyond Meat stock crashes, perhaps almost as bad as their taste. GM unveils an EV Cadillac Escalade. Proterra declares bankruptcy. Campbell's Soups to buy Rayo's sauce. And Tyson's Foods is unfortunately closing four plants. All of that and much, much more on The Topping Show. Thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of The Topping Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day. Gotta say, he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, that's the joke. If you're an IT leader or business owner, you need those systems, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Now, going over to the business part of the podcast, you have General Motors unveiling the EV Cadillac Escalade, which, in terms of marketing department, eh, maybe C minus. They're gonna call it the Escalade IQ, which other brands have used similar vernacular when it comes to naming their EV vehicles. But I suppose it still has the word Escalade in there so they can charge lots of money because it sounds fancy and expensive. Now, they claim that it's going to share little to nothing with the traditional models, traditional being the ones that actually currently make a profit for the company, known as the good old gas engine, the internal combustion engine. Of all the things General Motors has done over the past 100 plus years, the V8 was really one of their most, well, the bar's low, but one of the more reliable things they've created they made a great V8. And thankfully, they're still reinvested in that category. I think they just committed about a billion dollars, a little bit under a billion dollars a couple of quarters ago because they realized they need to make a profit while they're transitioning to the EV category. Now, in terms of how they're kind of, they're claiming the Escalade is going to be, they're saying it's a reinvention of an icon rather than a, a replacement. And that's a quote unquote from General Motors, which Again, you're almost tarnishing the original brand. There's nothing wrong, well, unless you care about long-term reliability with an EV. There's nothing wrong with an EV, except for that thing, but, well, depreciation. But inherently, if you want an EV, that's not a terrible thing, unless you really want to have fun. Three pedals is key man transmission for an automotive experience, personally, but create a new vehicle. Instead of bastardizing what used to be your legacy brands, you see this General Motors is going to take the Camaro, which used to be one of the best-selling pony cars, is one of the muscle cars, good old V8 with three pedals and manual transmission. Camaros this fiscal year, they're selling at about 151% compared to the last fiscal year because they said it's going to be the last year with having it be a good old gas vehicle. They're actually going to have next year, the Camaro is going to be an EV four-door sedan. So they're going to try, GM is going to pretend or try to make an exciting, sporty EV sedan, which I, I can't conceive them winning in that category, except for the 12 people who still work at General Motors who get the friends and family discount. I'm kidding. They probably have, their, maybe they have 28 people still working there. Calm down. You still work at GM. Just kidding. But if you want an EV sporty vehicle, you're either going to buy a Tesla Model S, which they have the premium trim, maybe it's a Tesla Model Plaid, which goes really ridiculously fast, or... If you want a more sporty EV four door, you can get the Porsche Taycan, which is, you know, has its EV ground up design. But no, they thought, let's just take our one of our most beloved brands and dilute the brand. Will it be successful? I doubt so. Now, when it comes to getting back to the Cadillac Escalade, this is all part of Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors. They promised Wall Street they're going to make EVs profitable, which, again, takes a lot of time and a lot of engineering skills. The, We'll see if they have them, but I mean, it took Tesla years upon years to become profitable. And they also have a huge gap on the competition in terms of engineering proficiencies and all the capabilities and the manufacturing capabilities. And again, GM, they want their EV profits comparable to gas profits by mid-decade, which no, they it, it, no, because the amount of upfront cost GM is going to have to do to do this is going to be pretty astronomical. And again, there's just so much more that goes into EV in terms of cost when you look at the software. They basically have to build a tech company because of all the software that is needed to make an exceptional EV. 
That's why you look at Tesla's, you look at all the employees who work there, there's a lot of engineers who work at Tesla. Now, Mary Barr, again, going back to General Motors, they claim they want their EV revenue be, to be $90 billion by 2030, which again, time shall tell. Now, Cadillac Vice President John Roth, he actually declined to discuss the Escalade's profit margins because they probably don't want to admit it is one of the more profitable things they create as part of the benefit of Cadillac is you charge more because it's viewed as more of a premium brand. So he's not telling us the actual profit margins, but he did say that when it comes to Escalade that quote, certainly carriers its fair share of weight. Now, current models that the good old internal combustion engine Cadillac Escalade, they range from about $81,000 to $150,000, which is pretty big gap. Granted, that's for the top, you know, best of the line trim, best performance, but that's a huge amount of money that they could charge for those things, and people are still buying it. Granted, if you're a fan of GM, or, or uh, I was gonna say, if you just have a little bit of rudimentary automotive technology, you know, you know, a lot of these vehicles share the same assembly lines as the Chevrolet product line. You look at this with the Chevy Silverado and the GMC Sierra, it's this, those two trucks are the same factory. They just slap out badges, paint, and a couple of little materials in the middle. So in terms of profit margins, GM, is, GM should be very careful with how they manipulate, how they change Cadillac. They, previously, they said they're gonna kill a Cadillac, C, I believe it's a CTS-4, which has a twin turbo V6 with the main transmission. That's making huge waves in the automotive community and the, the enthusiast community. And the CTS-V, which I believe is a CT-5, they also have the V8 with this manual transmission, one of their few vehicles left. And unfortunately, they said they're gonna kill the man manual transmission for the V6 twin turbo edition, which is the CT4. Again, Cadillac could do better with their marketing, although I'm sure an Cadillac enthusiast can tell you every single model number down to the little letters. But it'll be interesting to see how many of those customers follow them over. Now, again, Mary Barra has been very vocal, the CEO, Joe Motors, they want the company to be 100% EV by 2035, which the clock is ticking. You the amount of lead time you need to hear all these transitions, it may sound like a long way away, but in terms of all the back end logistics, all the planning they need to do, this needs to be something they're constantly working on. And even with all their efforts, they'll still decrease their headcount because she, she, like many other companies, they want to make the company more profitable. And they're trying to cut the, trim the fat from it. And she wants Cadillac specifically to be 100% EV by 2030, which again is getting closer than we think. So it'll be interesting to see as Cadillac starts to transition, will, will people pay? so much money for a EV Cadillac Escalade. People are certainly paying for the Hummer EV, but I would argue that's much more of a boutique vehicle. There's relative to the volume of Cadillacs that are made, the Hummer EV is more of a novelty for the production scale. I mean, the Cadillac Escalade, that's something they make like McDonald's sandwiches, basically. They just pop them out of a press. I'm sure they have, they do have a couple of models that require a little bit more fit and finish, but it's interesting to see they're starting to toy with their most profitable, important product that they sell, I would I would think. If you think of all the things that GM is making, the only thing that's pretty expensive is the Corvette. I'm not sure about how much profit the dealerships are, you know, charging, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 grand over list price. I'm not sure the profit margins for GM on the specific Corvette. I would not think they'd be comparable to Cadillac Glasclade. I mean, from a fiscal perspective, this is one of the most important vehicles. It'll be interesting to see do they take a more balanced approach and keep the V8 or they just go all into a switch? Just last, just a couple days ago, Mercedes is coming back from an inline four engine for the AMG, which again, for them, AMG is the pinnacle of Mercedes. This was the hand-built engines in Germany. They had the inline four. All the fans were, of course, extremely disappointed because the inline four having four cylinders is literally half as eight. I know you have test scores at all time low, so I'll do a little help, help here today. That's 50% less. So two independent resource, uh, sources at Mercedes had both said they're bringing the V8 back by 2026 because the fans, the consumers demand it. I can't help but think of probably have a similar instance where someone who wants a Cadillac Escalade, they want that power of a V8, the reliability of a V8. They don't want to worry about charging times. And again, the one of the difficult things with EVs and heavier vehicles, the heavier it is, you know, the more of a drain it is on the batteries. So it'll be interesting to see, what does GM do from here? Their track record is, of course, worrisome to say the least in terms of what will they do, but they usually bounce back through bankruptcy. They've gone bankruptcy quite a few times, but they somehow always just keep, I was about to say roaring, around, roar, roaring along, but in this case it might just be an EV noiselessly going along, which of course, yes, that sounds as exciting as the EV vehicle. Not too interesting. Now, 
Other interesting business use, you have a couple of these fake meat companies. So you have Beyond Meat, which is beyond BS, but the, it's called Beyond Meat. Their stock crashed 20%. Now, this comes after the company reported that their sales were lackluster, to say the least, as people, for some weird reason, are refusing to pay for that flavorless plant goop. And they actually cut their full year's sales forecast, which is one of the most detrimental things you can do if you're publicly traded, is go out there and tell people, yeah, this is our goal for the year. We're admitting right now we're not very good. We're going to have to adjust that lower. We're going to lower the bar. Here, here's the bar. We don't think we're going to get there. So we're going to lower the bar. Everyone lower their expectations. We're not doing great. So needless to say, that had a lot of investors concerned. Now, it looks like in terms of their net, their actual cutting, as of last, last Monday earlier this week, the stock in terms of the year was up 24% up to about a market value of $981 million, but then Tuesday it dropped 20% down. Now granted, there's a lot of big money behind big, you know, there's a lot of people like Bill Gates who really believe in this type of stuff. And a lot of those folks are pumping money into these markets or in these specific products. So it'll be interesting to see how long they can keep it up. And this is a decrease in sales, even as, it, even as they're slicing the prices of this junk. When, again, no one really knows the long-term health downsides to this there's a lot of unhealthy usually with when it comes to plant-based stuff there's a lot of unhealthy oils that they put in there i mean time shall tell us see what it goes with now the ceo ethan brown said that he's focusing on fighting customers perceptions that the products aren't healthy and he blames special interest interest groups for seeding fear and doubt around beyond ingredients and manufacturing processes now it also is probably down to if you look at the ingredients panel and most of these things and you probably can't pronounce or i can't pronounce perhaps half of the things that are on there because a lot of artificial stuff. And yeah, it's just one of the things where just just have a good steak or hamburger or even a salmon. But yeah, my three cents. In San Francisco, this company might flourish. They might be the biggest thing since, well, I guess they don't eat bread anymore because carbs are bad. They might be the biggest thing since, let's see, probably in San Francisco, defecating on the street and copious amounts of drugs in San Francisco. But for the rest of the U.S., I don't think this trend will catch on too much. We'll see. Other interesting business use, you have Proterra declaring bankruptcy as you have another EV company bite the dust. Now, this is actually only a couple of months after you had the giant EV truck company called Lordstown Motors. Now, that was an interesting business idea where GM was going to shut down yet another one of their failing factories. So investors came in and said, hey, well, if we turn this factory into making EV trucks or pickup trucks. You had a lot of big money thrown in there. You had a, a giant tech company come in and say, yeah, we'll help or, we'll help out uh, with you guys. And unfortunately, they just they couldn't make it and they crashed and burned. Now, Proterra was known for its ZX5 Max electric bus that they rolled out last year. It was one of the first EV battery packs off the assembly line in its latest production facility over in South Carolina. And they also had, in addition to its own vehicles, the Proterra-powered EVs like the Thompson-built buses they all eclipsed a million miles. Ooh. Which again, you know, why, why have a traditional diesel powered school bus or a uh, bus at a city that you can easily maintain for millions of miles with, you know, simple maintenance, relatively speaking, when you could have a computer on wheels where you need 12 different degrees to diagnose it. Oh, and by the way, you're not allowed to because you don't own it. Someone else owns it, similar to your iPhone or whatever type of te proprietary technology you like to lock yourself in with. Yeah, troublesome to say the least. Now I would venture to say more expensive long term. Now it looks like it is Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and they're declaring its assets and liabilities somewhere between the range of 500 million and 1 billion dollars. This is according to Reuters, and they previously had a market cap of 362 million as of Monday's close. But of course, as soon as this news came out, their stock crashed in half. So unfortunately, it seems like the outlook is not so good for that EV company. Perhaps. I don't know how much intellectual property they have. Maybe Tesla will swoop in or some other company will swoop in and buy up what might be beneficial from them. But hopefully, overall, too many jobs hopefully are not lost. Now, other interesting business use, you have Campbell Soup to buy Rayo Sauce for $2.7 billion. Now, that is a spicy meat ball, as some might say. Now, it looks like they specifically bought Sobos brands and that's the brand that actually makes, or the brand or the parent company behind the pasta sauce company. And that company also owns the intellectual property of Nusa Yogurt. Interesting. 
And of course, with these deals, it's probably going to take months going back and forth. So they expect the deal to officially close more towards Q4 2023. So around maybe most likely December is actually what they're projecting it as. Now, perhaps a good move by Campbell's because believe it or not, which I suppose I can believe, I. I have, haven't had uh, much urge for um, salt soup in a can. I have salt shakers somewhere, I'm sure. I can just put that in water and be close enough. But in terms of Campbell's soup, their year-over-year sales are consistently down about 11% every year as more and more Americans are apparently moving away from the staples of Campbell's soup, which, now that I think about it, I don't know. Let me know in the comments. When was the last time you actually had soup from Campbell's can? I just remember as a kid, they were just basically a salt lick with like one or two vegetables thrown in there that or were the remnant, the derivatives of a vegetable, perhaps, or be more accurate. But I mean, if you're a kid, maybe you have the grilled, the, what was it? The grilled cheese sandwich and you dunk it in the Campbell's tomato soup. But I can't fathom the last time I, I've never, I don't believe I ever even purchased Campbell's soup now that I think about it. But Right, that's just my anecdotal evidence. That's just me. Now, it looks like Solovis on the other brand, again, that's the company that owns Rayo Sauce, they've had exponential growth recently, and they actually reached a valuation of $1.3 billion following the initial public offering back in 2021, which is pretty darn good. Now, granted, of course, when it comes to all these situations, you always have to, if a company's doing good, you usually have to buy them for a premium. So you're going to pay above whatever this, you know, however you negotiate it. Usually they'll pay, they'll have negotiations where they'll say, hey, we'll offer you know, $5 above the last stock price or price per share. And then of course you multiply it by the whole market. So it'll be interesting to see, is Campbell's now going for this more premium brand because they're giving up on their own? It doesn't, I'm not hearing a lot of, and I've yet to see any marketing around turning that brand around. I don't see any, granted a you know, small sample size, I don't consume too much media, but when was the last time you saw a Campbell's commercial? I mean, it might have been 10 plus years. Like back when back when my family had cable. Like the last time I actually saw their logo or heard about their brand. I I can't fathom when on earth the last time I saw that was. Which perhaps is one of the issues is people forgetting about the brand. Which perhaps is also another reason to bring up. You have Pepsi and Coca-Cola, some of the largest, most popular brands on the planet. To this day, even though everyone, you know, they don't want you to forget who they are. So they'll sponsor every sporting event, every... Um, music event, they're out there advertising every day. So I think certain staples or certain things that could be kind of viewed as commodities, such as a soup or you know corn syrup in a can, you have to keep pushing a specific brand to remind folks you're still there. And maybe Campbell's just, it'll be interesting. Let me know in the comments, why do you move away com com from Campbell's? Or am I, am I, the, oh, I can't be the only one because they got, you know, 11% year over year decline in sales. So let me know in the comments, what do you think is going on with Campbell's soup? Now, going over to the culture part of the podcast, you have Americans having credit card debt hitting a record $1 trillion for the first time, which is astronomical. That's more money than most people can possibly fathom. Now, during the second quarter, the credit card balances apparently shot up by an increase of 45, again, $45 billion, which equated to about 4.6% to land the total amount of credit card debt held by Americans to $1.03 trillion, this according to the New York Fed's latest quarterly reports on household debt and credit. Now, it looks like the average credit card charges a near record 20.53% interest rate, this according to bankrate.com, which is one of the th few things where, yeah, public schools, they it's astonishing how little they teach. And again, there are some good public schools, but did your public school teach you anything about basic finances or anything relatively useful to setting you up as being successful contributing member of society? Granted, I think, you know, morally, of course, that all, most of the things fall on the parents, but like why in math class are they not teaching you simple things like here's how you balance a checkbook or modern, this is how you do that. Now I have one lesson that I would think is valuable. I got pretty lucky. I had one or two good teachers, which is more than mo many can say, where they actually had an exercise where they said, okay, Billy, here's your credit card bill. You could pay the maximum. Of course you could pay it all off or you could pay the minimum amount. And in class, we did that exercise where we go, here's the minimum amount. If we let's pay that every single month, how long would it take to pay off that credit card bill? And I believe the credit card bill in this made up scenario was, I believe, a couple, at least like four to five grand or something like that. And guess what? You never paid it off. 
because the percentage of interest on that specific scenario was so high, you're only paying off the, print, the uh, interest, not the principal. Another important lesson everyone should know, but not a lot of people know, if you pay the minimum, you're not really making a dent in the actual debt. And credit card debt is extremely, extremely dangerous. It'll catch up with you before you know it. And a lot of people don't realize you need to, again, I know everyone has things that pop up. Not everyone can have the emergencies happen and not everyone is in a situation where they can pay it off all off every month, but I highly recommend it because again, 20.53%. That is astronomical. That's perhaps I was going to say I need to open a credit card company if I was perhaps more, more, more maybe if I was morally ambiguous or vacuous, but 20.53%. Now, it looks like credit card debt has actually risen for the past five consecutive quarters, increasing at a sum of the longest rates in 20 years. Now, this is again according to the analysis by New York Fed data, which is astronomical. And I think a lot of you, it's not too hard to say why. A lot of people are struggling right now. You got 40 year hyperinflation because the US government left and right both decided to print more money than it ever been printed before. We also have all this economic uncertainty. Businesses are worried, you know, what's gonna happen with the election? What kind of policies are gonna affect them? What kind of regulation might kneecap their businesses? There's so much uncertainty. And again, I believe, I forget which article it was, but you consistently hear these articles where the average American can't afford to absorb a $400 emergency, like if it, in terms of that would fiscally be prohibited to them where they would have to put on a credit card or ask family for help. So, so one of the issues from a cultural perspective is fascinating to see Americans love credit cards. And I remember they're pushed like, they almost, they're on par with drug dealers in terms of my college experience and credit cards are just pushed down your throat. Now, thankfully I have more, I was raised a pretty gosh darn good. So I said no to both. I didn't get my credit card till later in life when I actually had a need for one, but it's just the same, yeah, same, I'm not a, I'm one of those folks where I was thinking I want to be the best both fiscally as well as mentally. So yeah, I'm not too big a fan of the drugs either. Now, it looks like, it'll be interesting to see, is this a wake up call? Do people start to realize how bad you know things are getting? Do they find another job or another credit card or side gig? How do they start paying it down? Because they need to start paying down these things. And hopefully everyone gets the help they need or they can find a new job, but Culturally speaking, it's fascinating to see just people racking up more and more debt. And hopefully, you know, everyone turns out for the better before it gets worse. Now, other cultural news, you have Bud Light being forced to sell some of its brands. The boycott is working. Now, again, winding back the clock, just, just imagine five months ago, Bud Light was the best selling beer in North America for 20 years. The number one. And then April 1st, which, the, the, the irony is hilarious. April 1st, it was not a joke. They chose to, uh, they decided to uh, partner with Dil Mulvaney, a very famous trans activist, although never got the surgeries. So many people are suspicious to see if Dylan's actually authentic. Also, it seems to be very pejorative in Dylan's portrayal of women and where Dylan wears high heels hiking in the woods. I asked my mom and my sister, and that, that's not a thing that women do when Dylan is celebrating Dylan's days of womanhood, which Although it has netted Dylan millions of dollars with brand endorsements, this one kind of backfired the most. Many people, including myself, critique the main pivotal reason why people have a backlash to Bud Light was because, unlike the other brands, Bud Light, you can only sell to people who are 21 up. The average user on TikTok, the highest percentage of user base, about 25%, is under, ni is under 19 years old. Dylan's audience has been rumored, and I'm so, if you have the data, let me know in the comments, they're at, that Dylan's average user, user age is 15 years old both underage in the United States to purchase beer. Now, granted, I would also argue most adults shouldn't but purchase Bud Light because it is repugnant taste, unless you're already drunk in college. That seems to be their core market. So they chose to partner with Dill Mulvaney, April 1st, and then they had the leak of Alyssa Heiderschild, the brainchild, the proud marketing executive at Bud Light. A video of her came out saying that she was worried the brand was too fratty, even though she had pictures of her drinking Bud Light or some type of beer from prophylactic in college, which cover your ears if you have kids listening. Prophylactic is a very fancy word for condom, which again, people make mistakes in colleges, but for her to be so hypocritical was also kind of icing on the cake for many people who started the boycott. Subsequently, they've been losing sales week after week after week, and their competitors are thriving. These guys are so bad, they're finally, they're starting to sell brands. Now, specifically, beginning of the year, Anheuser-Busch and Bev, a global organization, they had 52 brands, a huge, huge market share, obviously. Now. Specifically, they're going to be selling eight of their craft beer brands. 
to a company called Tilray Brands, which looks like to be a Canadian cannabis company. And it's going to drastically cut back on Bud Light's craft beer portfolio. As throughout the years, they did purchase not just big brands that we all know, but also a lot of the smaller brands. Now, the specific brands that they're selling will be, well, let's see here. We got Shock Top, which I think some people heard of. It's got the funny looking logo. You got Breckenridge Brewery, Blue Point Brewing Company, Ten Barrel Brewing, Red Hook Brewery, Windmere Brothers Brewing, Square Mill Cider Company, and Hill Highball Energy. Now, in many, and this is also be worth noting. They're not just selling the brands, which that's a very common thing in many industries. You just sell the brand and it's like a licensing thing, but they're actually selling the whole infrastructure behind the brand. So not only are they selling the specific product lines of the brand that is shop top so someone else can make it, they're also selling the employees, the breweries and associated brew pubs. Now, the good news from the employees perspective is they sh there shouldn't be too many jobs lost. It seems as if they're basically selling and they're spinning off an entity of the business. Where you have certain companies like General Motors, where they own, you know, Chevy, Cadillac, GMC, Buick. If you were to sell, you couldn't really sell one brand because a lot of employees all work together. They're not really separate in turn. They're separate, but there's a lot of overlap. A lot of the parts are shared. In these perspectives, it seems that they are more independent from Anheuser Busch and Bev in their operation. So hopefully, not too many jobs are lost. Now, because of course this will take some time to actually go through. They're expecting the deal to close later this year, more around September 2023, for $85 million. This is according to Tilray's 8K filing. Now, $85 million sounds like a fair amount of money, but their sales, again, over the same fiscal Q2 period last year compared to this year, they're down between what report you read, 390, 395 million to $400 million. Whatever number of those three you choose to believe, that's not good news. That is nearly half a billion dollars in sales that just went away. And it didn't just evaporate. People didn't, just didn't stop drinking. They actually, they just went to the competitors. So it is interesting to see, they're actually, everyone kept saying the Bud Light, the boycott's not working. They're so big, they can absorb it. Well, this is a huge change from a business perspective. And as Bush and Bev seems to be pivoting from having a very diverse group of beers to now it seems like they're focusing on more of the big brands, the massive volume ones. Like, I don't think anyone buys a Bud Light for the taste, unless they're, unless they are a burn victim in a building, their, their tongue was eviscerated, burned. But most people just drink it because it's legally beer. I think the percentage of alcohol is pretty darn low, but it's not like a connoisseur is sitting there. I'll, that'd be maybe a funny parody, a free idea in the comment section. There's not a connoisseur sitting back, you know, sipping and absorbing the flavor of a Bud Light. Like, that doesn't happen. So it's interesting to see that maybe they're trying to focus on the few brands they have left. Well, few. Again, going 52 minus eight. And I think I sold one more earlier about a month ago. So they still have a massive portfolio, but from a business perspective, I think they're not they're gonna get away from craft brewing entirely. Craft brewing is also a great example of supporting locally owned. Most people that I know who do drink craft beer, part of the reason they like to drink it is because a lot of the craft breweries are local to them. It's a great way, it's a great way to build a community together. So those as, that's as, there's that aspect to it. And you know, when it's owned by a parent Belgian company halfway across the globe, it's perhaps a little bit less authentic. So maybe that's what they're thinking. But either way, Outlook is not so good for Bud Light. So if you believe in boycott, keep up the good work because it is certainly working. Other interesting business news, you have Bud Light sales down yet again, about 26%. Now. Specifically, the sales are down 25.9%. This, again, for the week ending of July 29th. Now, of course, or you shouldn't be too surprised. This this means that for the third month of low, so for 20 years, they were the number one best-selling beer in North America. Then they lost Modelo two months ago, or three months ago. So for two months in a row is Modelo. I can't help but once we get all the sales figures in, I'm pretty darn sure Modelo will be number three again. So. Uh, again, hindsight, sorry, 20, always 2020 with investing, which had a part in Constellation Brands. Since in the United States, Modelo is owned by Constellation Brands. I believe they're headquartered out of New York. So if you believe in the boycott, go in the United States, go ahead and buy the Modelo. It was why Bud Light was able to merge with uh, InBev out of Belgium. So the U.S. Security Exchange Commission, so the SEC, in order to allow the merger of the combination of companies, they told them, hey, the U.S. market, you're going to have to spin off Modelo. So if you're in another country and you're buying Modelo, you are supporting Anheuser-Busch in Bev, 
but in the US, it is a foreign owned brand at this time. Now, it looks like, again, so you had Bud Light down about 26%. Now, on the contrast, you have Modelo is up 14.8%. Coors Light is up 14.8%. Miller Light is up 19.25%. And the OG bringing up the rear, Yangling at 22%, which there is something about fighting for and believing the underdog that is somewhat reminiscent of American spirit. Yangling is still family owned to this day, the oldest brewery in the, or in the United States, which are huge testaments in and of itself. All these other companies, even Anheuser-Busch, which I believe you had the grandfather working the company, the founder, uh, the father working the company, the grandson was the one who unfortunately had to sell it off or sold it off. And of course now it's Anheuser-Busch in Bev. So it is sad to see a lot of these companies around for literally a oh, family legacy sold after all these. So Yangling to still be family owned, I admire that. And I actually bought my first case a couple weeks back for my interview podcast for guests to enjoy. Now, granted, I did get Yangling Light, which some people might debate in and of itself, but I like to run. I like, if I do have dry beer, I, it is a light beer I prefer. Granted, I'm more of a spirits gentleman myself when the location calls for it. But it's fascinating to see Yangling hasn't had to do much marketing. All they've done is stay out of politics, which from a cultural perspective, it's fascinating to see some of these brands lean full in to wanting to get involved in politics. And I have yet to see it increase their sales. You're gonna get the increase of sales perhaps to the people you pander to, but in Bud, Light, in Bud Light's case, they they brilliantly, or I don't know, that's obviously ironic for me to say, the business blunder of them is they pissed off the left and the right and the middle. Since they, and again, this is a quote by a bar owner in Chicago or a holding company in Chicago, they claim that Bud Light didn't stand by Dylan Mulvaney, so that gave our holding company who owned four bars in uh, Chicago suburbs they will no longer ever sell Bud Light because they didn't stick and they didn't feel their commitment to the LGBTQ um, plus trans community was authentic. So you have people on the left who are pissed, the right who are pissed, and the people who are in the middle, they they just want to have a beer and not have to talk about politics, so they're not buying it as well. Now, even more disgusting, all this decrease in sales performance, the wrong people are getting hurt. Now, Anderson Bush, they still won't say they fired Alyssa Hirschild. There's a lot of speculation saying they can't say the word fired because she would sue the company. Which only in America could you destroy a brand by again stock down twenty eight trillion dollars or a billion dollars sorry, and four hundred million dollars in lost sales? You should be able to say she is the worst marketing executive ever. Like name me in the comments one bigger marketing mistake than this right now. Four hundred million dollars gone. Yet because of the American legal system and how litigious everyone is, or um. It is astonishing they still have to worry about, oh no, she's on unpaid leave. A leave of absence is what she's officially on. Now, there's a lot of speculation saying she got a golden parachute so that she wouldn't sue the company, which again, disgusting that she even fathoms suing the company for her mistake. But about a little, about 400 employees got laid off at Bud Light because they're in the marketing department and they wanted to refresh the company. They, they said it was because of reorganization, which is just political speak for, political speak for getting rid of those folks. And I believe it was maybe 360 or 380, around 400 people. And some of them for sure perhaps was, were part of the marketing initiative of Dylan, but some of them were just trying to do their job. They didn't have a call in that. They didn't get a say. And then you had the two bottling plants that were shut down because so few people are buying Bud Light. You got a third party, so a, a third, not Bud Light, but someone else who owned the plants. They're operating, I believe, uh, two plants. And that was, I believe, another 600 jobs gone, or 600 jobs evaporated. Because again, if people aren't buying the Bud Light Swill, they don't need that glass bottle. Now, hopefully these other companies are growing at such a rate so that overall the total number of jobs aren't lost. So they're, actually di they're simply displaced to the other companies and I hope they hire at an ever increasing rate. And I hope Yangling keeps making more and more factories, more and more breweries so that they can get those folks new jobs. Because again, someone just making glass bottles, you could debate whether they had a, it's a, certainly a debate of whether they participated in the boycott or if they believed in what they were doing because they were indirectly supporting Bud Light. Whether they, if they really were against that morally with Del Mulvaney, they could have walked away from that job. But either way, they weren't a direct correlation to that decision. So I hope all those folks are able to get their jobs back. But unfortunately, not all of them will. So we'll see where we go from here. But yet another week of the business blunder of Bud Light just decreasing and tanking their sales again and again and again. That could almost be a whole segment in and of itself, but we'll see where they go from here. Other interesting culture news, you have Bud Light. Are they censoring third-party YouTube videos about them? 
Now, I can't help but notice, I posted a couple videos about Bud Light, and specifically, two or three, three videos I posted on August 7th. And I'm someone where I might not agree with what you have to say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. And you can see that as evidence in most of the comments section, they're not always positive. And I do appreciate the critique that helps build the channel, whether it's me talking too fast or not looking at the camera enough. Thanks to you guys, we've, we've been able to make the experience better for everyone. And I've grown, and I think we've gotten a little bit better over time. So I always by default allow all comments. I went to look at these videos a couple hours and a couple days after I posted them. The Bud Light ones specifically had the comments disabled. Yet, I had specifically put that video highlight or the settings so that it would allow all comments. No other videos of mine are doing this. And I can't help but think it's not a coincidence. None of my videos about GM or any of the companies that I critique are getting any of the issues where the comments are magically deactivated. Now, astonishingly enough, even this morning, I checked the video where I talked about, and again, I manually changed it back to allow all comments. I even post highlighted my comments so that people could respond to that if for some reason they something else squirrely happened. But as of this morning, I also checked out another video, or really uh, yesterday morning, where I was looking at the video where I made talking about how Bud Light has had such a business blunder that other companies are actually changing their hiring practices to specifically hire people who are quote unquote non-woke. Specifically, there's a tech company out of Western Australia where they wanted people, they wanted endeavors to thaw and they didn't want someone with those types of political beliefs. Now, that got a couple hundred views, which for me is pretty good and I appreciate every single view, but when I looked at the comments, they were disabled again. So I had to go into the YouTube creator and I, again, slammed the button that says allow all comments. But I can't help but think this, with how much, I don't know how much Bud Light is spending on YouTube. I've heard other stories about certain videos getting pulled because YouTube, you know, Bud Light does spend money on YouTube. They give them money. My company, we, this company, I mean, my company, my media company isn't paying for YouTube ads yet. We don't have the capacity. If you click that, if you help click the subscribe button, we'll get to the monetization eventually and more and more people to tune in. But right now, the, this channel isn't actually generating revenue for YouTube. So I don't know if that's just a further incentive for them to choose Bud Light over us, but with all, I always tell people when it comes to tech, I don't really believe in, or most things in life, I don't believe in coincidences. coincidences. And it's so strange that only the Bud Light videos are getting censored in terms of the comments. And again, my profile by default, every time I make a video, it saves that it allows all comments. So now I'm almost double and triple checking every time I have a Bud Light video. I'll go and I'll check the video a day after, just make sure the comments are still open. It, let me know in the comments if you can. Have you seen this with other YouTube videos about Bud Light? So it'll be fascinating to see. Hopefully, if you have information or if you work at, you know, if you have one, if you're a whistleblower, you want to let me know, you can always reach me at thetoppingshow at gmail.com. Although, ironically, that's, of course, owned by Google, so they might just delete the email. But I digress. If you reach out to me, I'd love to report anything that you guys have seen on your end as well. But we shall see. Perhaps their business blunder is just as bitter as their beer, and they don't want anyone knowing about it. Time shall tell. Now, other interesting cultural news, you have a woman fired for not working because of keystroke technology. Oh, how times have changed. Now, rudimentary speaking, keystroking technology is basically a software where it monitors your laptop to see when you're, depending on detail they want, they can even know what exactly what you're typing in terms of the words. But in terms of work monitoring software, a lot of companies, again, if it's a company's entity or the company owns the laptop, this their property to do whatever they want, legally speaking. So they'll install some tracking software. I remember it was a pain when I worked at some tech companies where they actually had that to micromanage you, not to make you a better employee. Now in this case, because everyone is let maybe they'll work from home, companies are starting to deploy this tech because they're wondering, are people really working eight hours a day? Now, the pessimist to me would say, no, absolutely not. At the end of the day, personally, what I think is if they hit their metrics that are defined to make them an exceptional employee, as long as they're hitting, hitting or better exceeding those metrics, we really shouldn't matter how many hours are being put in, you're paying for that performance. Now, hourly workers, of course, that's a much more different situation. Now, it looks like this is a, for this specific instance, this is a major insurance company, and it looks like it was over in Australia. And according to the commission's, according to this article, it actually says they're responsible for creating insurance documents, meeting regular timelines, monitoring, or work from home compliance. And she had this role, and 
it looks like in terms of their actual findings around her, they were wondering, you know, how many times is she actually turning on the computer and, you know, logging in to work? And they found that she didn't work her rostered hours for 44 days. She started late 47 days. And fin she finished early 29 days and performed zero hours of work four days. Now, granted, if you request a day off, those don't count. But there's four days where she got paid and she didn't do any work, which is ridiculous. And in terms of being late, if she's an hour employee, that is just, that's like a pet peeve. I always tell people, if you're 10 minutes early, you're late. If you're 15 minutes early, you're on time. Because guess what? Stuff happens. Car traffic, accidents. There's always variables that you need to account for when you, especially when you have physical meetings. And they go on to say, in this case, she averaged 54 strokes per hour over the time of her, over the duration of her surveillance, which showed she was, quote, she was not presenting for work and performing the work as required. And it looks like she was there for years upon years. And funny enough, she goes, oh, yeah, I have evidence that um, I, I, I was actually working, but then she never actually produced anything. I mean, I can't help, but I can't fathom what evidence she might have unless she was working a, in a spiral notebook. But again, when it comes to her role, it was all about inputs in the, into the computer because many jobs these days, a lot of tasks that, tasks that are measured are all electronic. And it's fascinating to see from a cultural perspective, Will you see more and more American, in terms of American adoption, will Americans revolt against this? Will they say, I will not work at your company if you micromanage me or if you monitor me in that regard? Or will people kind of accept as a trade-off, yes, they can work at home as long as they hit the metrics that, the lab, that can be monitored? Let me know in the comment section, which one would you prefer? Because if you're hitting the metrics, but you have that software in place, maybe it's not too bad. A lot of people would say it would be a better alternative than spending, you know, two hours a day plus in traffic, paying for gasoline. We shall see what, from culturally speaking, it'll be interesting to see how it pivots around. Now, going over to the political part of the podcast, you have the ATF memo leaking saying they want to ban all gun sales in terms of private ownership. Now, is this the prime example of a, what is it, a red herring? Why, yes, it is, actually. It's much, much more about this. Now, thankfully, this information comes to us thanks to ammo.com as well as Iraq Veteran 8888, who, in terms of firearm knowledge and production, I can't recommend his channel enough. So he actually reads through a couple of these documents, and his voice is infinitely better than mine. So we're going to play that for a couple minutes and break it down. The Biden administration will use executive orders and the weaponized ATF to issue a rule limiting the private sales of firearms. According to the New York Times and verified by Ammo Land News sources, the new rule is expected to be unveiled by the end of the year. President Joe Biden plans to announce that he is directing the ATF to close what every town calls the private sales loophole and the digital loophole. Oh, my eyes. They hurt so hard because I rolled them back so much. It's one of those things where the private sales loophole is such a pejorative, silly thing. So kind of like the gun sales or the gun show loophole. It's ridiculous because it's not really. If you look at the statistics on gun shows, 99% of the sales are all through gun dealerships. Or rather, more accurately, FFLs or Federal Firearm Licensees. So that means they have a... Actually, you have to do paperwork. So it's one of those cliches where people think going to a gun show is Wild West... It's actually a lot more, it's a lot of fun. You see a lot of diverse guns in a very short amount of time. It's kind of the allure of the whole thing. It's a fun cultural phenomenon to go check out. But an overwhelming majority of all its guns there, if you buy them, you're buying from a dealership who's buying a table there to present all their guns. And you have to do a standard background check. You have to fill out a 4473, which is a legal document, federal legal, legal document. They give a job application to buy a gun. But again, if you or I, if we lie on that document, we get 15 years in prison. But... Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, who is a crackhead, he could lie in that domic document to basically get no consequences at all. He, he was smart enough to admit in an autobiography he was on illicit substances, and that time frame was the same exact time frame he actually filled out the paperwork. Yep, 15 years for uh, us, but uh, yep, for him, if he were to do that, probably get away scot free. The private sales loophole is when an individual sells a firearm for profit but does not possess a federal firearms license, also known as an FFL. Also, with the digital loophole, that's pretty ridiculous in and of itself. They go into talk about the forums so you can buy stuff. When you talk to the average person on the streets about, oh yeah, I bought it, you can buy a gun online, no background check. 
legally you can buy it in terms of they can take your credit card but let's say you go to gunbroker.com and they're not sponsored but they're just like ebay for guns you can buy it but it can't ship to your door unless it's an antique so it's a modern firearm it goes to your local and you choose your local ffl federal firearms license holder so local gun store who again they have that paperwork with the federal government you go to that gun store you fill out the background check the 4473 they run your name through the NICS system and then you take possession of the firearm everyone thinks if you go online you just buy it and it goes right to your door unless you are an ffl holder that doesn't happen but that's what the media keeps pushing and of course no one trusts them anymore for good reason although it pains me that 12 people still tune in probably Biden will call on the ATF to develop a new rule requiring anyone who makes any profit by selling firearms to possess an FFL. It should also be noted the ATF is cracking down on FFL holders. So actually critiquing them more and taking those licenses away, also de destroying many people's ability to make a living, which I find disgusting as well. I, I can't help but see it's not in the Constitution. But you, you free them right to bear arms, except you need a paperwork? I'm, I'm confused. Guns tend to increase in value over time. A gun purchased in 1980 will likely sell for much more money today than its original value. The so-called digital loophole includes marketplaces like Arms List, Firearms Classified. Now, when it comes to Arms List, I actually bought one of my first guns off Arms List, but it was from a dealer. So I actually went on Arms List, I saw the ad, I contacted the person, it ended up to be a brick and mortar store, I drove all the way to the store. We did the 4473 paperwork. He then ran my name through the system for the background check, and I was able to take possession of the firearm. So again, when they say, oh yeah, these websites are all like that, well, there's also dealerships that use them too. Where private individuals can list their firearms for sale. The Biden administration wants to see these marketplaces shut down. There's nothing the government likes or the modern government likes more than censorship but it's unclear exactly how that unconstitutional goal will be accomplished. Websites like Arms List do not sell firearms directly. It is quite literally a town square for firearms. You don't buy them from Arms List, they simply facilitate the website where you can connect with people and advertise guns. In case you guys don't know, a website like that is where potential private sellers get connected essentially, and the platform itself has a complete hands-off approach to the way the transaction is, uh, is conducted. All they're simply doing is facilitating the people meeting up and discussing what they're wanting to buy, sell, trade, or whatnot, that sort of thing. Ammo Land News spoke to Arms List founder Jonathan Gibbon about the attacks his company faces and the upcoming ATF rule. Arms List, Arms List has been battling anti-gun groups for years, fending off several lawsuits. Arms List has a per It'd be nice if we had more constitutional judges where they saw a lawsuit and they go, oh, ridiculous, throw it out. The track record. But unfortunately, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are documents that far elude many people in power, unfortunately. Feeding these attacks, but the co uh, cases are costly. <clears throat> Private party transactions are not a loophole, Gibbon told Ammo Land News. Buying and selling firearms is a guaranteed right under the Second Amendment. Interfering with state laws allow... Also under this proposed law, you can't sell a gun to a family member. Is that logical? No. Is that unconstitutional? I would argue absolutely. Allowing citizens to exercise their Second Amendment right should concern everyone. Americans have a First Amendment constitutional right to use the internet to communicate about their other constitutional rights. The rule currently in draft form is expected to be announced later this year. The announcement will be followed by a public comment period the Biden administration aims to reveal the final rule by late spring or early summer of 2024 and for it to go into full effect by the fall of next year. The rule is still in the early stages of development, so the timeline is subject to change. Previous ATF rule changes, such as the frame and receiver rule, bump stock rule, and pistol brace rule, have been successfully challenged in court. The courts have ruled... Because again, the ATF is not supposed to make laws, they're supposed to enforce them, but... They have the ugly habit of reinterpreting things to de facto make new laws and turn hardworking Americans into criminals overnight, a simple stroke of a pen. That the ATF does not have the authority to pass these rules, subverting the powers of Congress to make laws. In an attempt to head off another deep... Now, the danger to you, or the people who possess those items in the meantime, they might not, but they can change the law today, and you're going to have to go fight that in court. And if they catch you, your life can be utterly destroyed. Defeat... 
The ATF and the Justice Department will claim that the power to require private sellers to obtain an FFL was dele delegated to them by Congress through the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. The Acronyms make it sound smart. Passing of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act last year changed the definition of what it means to be engaged in the business of dealing firearms. Section uh, 12002 of the law outfines the definition. And of course, you can read all the information at the link uh, that is in the article. And I will tag this particular link down below in, in, in the comment, or either in the comment section or in the description box, or both, honestly. Uh, click through if you want to engage in any of the links that you see on the screen, of course. Um, let's see. Uh, the, the BSCA was a massive gun control bill that passed Congress with the support of some Republicans. Rhinos. Republicans in name only. Yet another reason not to believe politicians left or right. Republicans are supposed to, in theory, stand up for gun rights, but I can't help but notice they more and more acquiesce to the left when it comes to that political issue. So, I don't trust most politicians as far as I can throw them, and most of them are morbidly obese and out of shape, so it'd be, tough, it'd be a tough thing to throw them. Granted, I do try left when I can. The bill changed the definition of a gun seller. The BSCA altered the wording of Section uh, 921 of Title 18, United States Code. The BSCA altered the definition of someone engaged in the business of selling guns from with the principal objective of livelihood and profit to the ambiguous statement of to predominantly earn a profit. That's what politicians love. Ambiguity where they can gray the lines and they can work it however they want. They, that's why a lot of these laws are very imprecise. They're not very, they're quite the antithesis in fact, they're the opposite. So they can cover whatever they want it to cover. Now the Biden administration is exploiting that change through the upcoming rule from the latest text or from the text of the BSCA. The term to predominantly earn a profit means that the intent underlying the sale and disposition of firearm is predominantly one of obtaining a procuratory gain as opposed to other intents such as improving or liquidating a personal firearms pr collection provided that proof of profit shall not be required as to per, as to a person who engages in the regular and repetitive purchase and disposition of firearms for criminal purposes or terrorism. Many gun rights groups tried to warn Republicans, such as Senator John Cornyn, uh, chief architect of the BSCA. That Where is that rhino from? He's the chief architect, John Cornyn. Let's see here, John C O R N Y N N Y N. Who is this? American politician, born 1952. Jesus. Let's see here. American politician, attorney, and former jur jurist, serving as a se senior United States senator from Texas. Oh, that's embarrassing. That's. We need to disown him. That's disgusting. That the Biden administration would exploit the anti gun law, but these pleas were ignored. Because they don't care about you or your ideals. They just want people to be dumb enough to vote for them. So that's why I highly recommend researching everyone you vote for. Left, right, center, libertarian. Look at their actual voting track record, not their BS political commercials they put out, which just lean into emotional rhetoric, left and right. The main force pushing for the new rule is Every Town for Gun Safety, the Bloomberg-backed anti-freedom group who sees the new requirements for, gun for sellers to obtain an F... It's kind of the point where the more nice a group or bill sounds, the more suspicious I am, because more often than not, it is a sheep and wolf, or rather a wolf in sheep's clothing. FFL to get closer to universal background checks. President Biden and other Democrat politicians have taken millions of dollars from the group and we need to see the organization's war chest for the upcoming elections. Let's see. Uh, universal background checks have been cornerstone of the Biden anti-gun plan, but so far have been a non-starter in Congress. Write your representatives today. Tell them you'll not ever accept a universal background checks. Because guess what? It's a de facto gun registration. Which, again, I know history scores and test scores in the United States public schools are at all-time low. If you look at a history book, you'll see that every time since the dawn of time you've had a gun registration, they are always taken away. The worst historical events in history always happen after that, consistently. That's why 
a lot of people give uh, shit to Ted Cruz. He has one or two good points. One of the brilliant things he did say, which was spot on, is there's only two reasons the government wants to know the serial numbers of your gun. To tax them or to take them. And historically speaking, they do that in that order. With the president unable to pass any bill that includes universal background checks, the White House is doing what it considers the next best thing. This rule shows the gun community that any compromise will be used against gun rights and the ATF claiming... If you give them an inch, they get... If you give them an inch, they take a mile. When have you ever gotten anything from compromise on this political issue? Have your gun rights increased? Has the 1934 Firearms Act, NFA Act been repealed in our lifetime? No. Many of the rights are just simply chiseled away and you get nothing to increase, which is why, particularly the NRA, they're at all-time... Very few people are joining the NRA these days. The other gun advocacy groups are far more efficient because they actually get things passed and actually fight these tyrannical laws. The NRA does some great safety work. They do safety constructions and trainings, but in terms of political wins and getting rights back, I, the last thing I remember the NRA being good for was December 12th, 2012, which is when they actually got concealed carry passed in Illinois because they challenged the course. They said that people have a legal right to do that. But even then they acquiesced where the people living there have to have a 16 to 20 hours class time and even more physical training, which again is used as a deterrent strategically so that people do not exercise their freedom to write and to actually bear arms. Authority through the BSCA shows that the recent losses have the ATF scrambling for to prevent future losses by pointing to legislation even if the law has to be taken out of context. All right, wonderful reporting there, uh, Mr. Crump. That's, uh, that's, of course, exactly what I would expect from one of John's articles. And this is scary. Look, we are going to have to keep a really close eye on this moving forward. Uh, of course, you know, once the comment period is opened up, remember, on the bump stock comment period, we dropped so many comments and the frame and receiver rule, anything that was open for comments, we rang the bell from the mountaintop and we got so many people. Now, when it comes to those comment sections where they open up to the public comment, I don't think we should be deterred to the fact that the ATF doesn't actually change anything when it comes to those comments, mostly. I think they have once or twice, historically speaking. It really just sends a message to who are your representatives in Congress because a lot of those folks are severe narcissists. They don't want to lose power. So if you show, hey, my entire district, 80% of the people who vote for me, they think this law is bad. If I vote for it, they're going to vote me out of that's something people, especially Republicans, you get better at. When they break their promises to you, vote them out. Don't allow them to get away with chiseling away at your rights. Just brainlessly, left and right, voting for someone just because they have an R or they have a D next to their name. If they don't walk the walk and talk the talk, that letter means nothing. Which, personally speaking, politically speaking, we just get rid of those. But if you don't know what the person stands for, you shouldn't be voting for them. I don't think we should have Republicans or Democrats or any letter next to the person's name. You should have to articulately know who you're voting for. Now, granted, I would actually be in favor of actually having you write in what your top one or two or three specific things you want them to do. Actually articulate why you like someone. But I know I'm not in charge of voting laws, regulation, so I'll digress. People to submit comments. Now, what it actually accomplishes, I, you know, that's probably questionable at best, but you still have to make the effort. And I think that Crump is correct when he, you know, mentions just how, you know, desperate the ATF is for some sort of perceived win, whether it's because they're trying to pander to the agenda of the Biden administration or rather whether they're trying to pander to the existence of their very organization. I mean, think about it in terms of budgets, right? When someone like the ATF gets a budget, if they don't use the entire budget, Okay, they'll, they won't get their same procurement of money the next year. Now, use course, it or lose it. I'm one of those people that thinks the organization needs to be greatly reduced, if not completely abolished uh, to begin with. However, they probably look at it in terms of, well, if we don't make ourselves relevant and don't make ourselves useful to the current administration, well, then they're going to cut our funding or they're going to cut our budget, and then we, we won't have the same budget next year or some greatly reduced budget. So the ATF is probably under a lot of internal pressure from their own leadership to do, even, even if it's just the perception of something, it's still something in the eyes of the current administration. And of course, if the current administration is the one giving them the marching orders, and then of course they comply with those marching orders, 
well, what do you think is going to happen when it comes down to their budget? They're going to get everything they need. They're going to get all the money they need. This all comes back down to, you know, people having a job. And, you know, the economy is crud right now. Buyer confidence is at an all-time low. Inflation is out of control. Everything is just going nuts right now. I mean, gun sales are way down. The, the gun industry is at one of the slowest times that it's been in quite some time. I mean, the 2020 boom of sales, you know, really put a shot in the arm of the industry. But we're starting to see that slow down slightly. I think that people are accessorizing, buying ammo, doing training. And in summer now, you know, a lot of folks are spending time with their family, which, of course, I would argue is a much better expenditure of your time and money especially with how crazy things have been over the last few years, lockdowns and things. So believe me, even though you have this large organization, they still feel the pinch of things being slow, just like the regular civilian world does too. And I'm certainly not saying that is an excuse for their actions, and I'm certainly not saying that, that I'm trying to cover for them in some way. I'm just telling you the reality of the way I see what justifies the actions that they're t undertaking in their eyes. Now, of course, we know the Biden administration is extremely anti-gun. I was going to say, once we get, you see this very cyclical gun sales when it comes to the presidential elections as well and midterms. I suspect gun sales in maybe six months, once they start to get closer to the 2024 election, depending on who's running, most likely right now, the data we have, it'll be most likely Trump versus Biden. You'll probably see an increase in gun sales as well as magazine sales. Would run them all through a wood chipper if they had their choice. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that this can go down, and the beauty of it is that we actually kind of know already how this is going to pan out because we know what, what's happening with the bump stock situation. We know what's happening with the frame and receiver rule. We know what's happening with the brace situation. So all of these things are currently being handed the slap down in federal courts all across the country. So we are gaining back some of this territory. And I think now, The dangerous thing is still, though, in the interim, you have the ATF say a rule, and it's being challenged. There are a lot of good, hardworking folks in the middle who they'll be tur turned into felons overnight. So it's it's a very murky situation. Think of anything, what this sort of ends up doing is it forces the hand of the regime, if anything. So yes, it's a shot in the dark to say, well, let's just shout this rule out from the mountaintops and you know what maybe people will just follow it and, and they won't fight against it and they won't challenge it and then it'll just or maybe they'll get more votes there are people who want guns banned in the united states i usually call them un-american since you know if you read a book by the founding fathers which i know literacy and all that type of thing all the time low but there are people who if they hear biden is doing this they will vote for him again because it's a political issue for a lot of people and people there are people who want to ban them and then of course there's people who want to actually maintain individuals' right to defend themselves. Be just as good as law. It'll be de facto law. And maybe uh, from a strategic standpoint, they have the right idea. You know, if, hey, if you can't get Congress to do anything, it's not like all the previous presidents haven't abused the power of the pen either. Left That's and important right. important to keep in mind. Don't let it cloud your judgment. You need to remember, even Trump, you know, I mean, Obama used the power. Trump banned the bump stocks, thereby turning Americans into felons basically overnight. So a lot of people love Trump. He's not 100% pro-gun. And the NRA, they endorse that idea. Which again, William LaPierre, every time the NRA calls me, I simply ask them the same question, which I know the answer to. Is William LaPierre still your leader? Yes, he is. No, I'm not giving you a penny. Not even half of a penny, which used to be legal U.S. currency way back in the day, which ironically a half penny now would be worth a pretty penny, ironically enough, because it's collectible. But I digress power of the pen. Trump used the power of the pen. In fact, it was Trump's power of the pen that got us the bump stock situation. So if we've got two regimes in a row, two presidents in a row that have handed down some form of, of executive order moving against guns in some way, it, it does bring into question what the overall strategic value might be in that. Again, I know people always say 5D chess and this and that, but the truth is, by using executive fiat, it forces the hands of the courts to respond to this in some way. And of course, that's why gun groups such as GOA, FPC. GOA being Gun, Owner, gun Owners of America, which is a great, fantastic group. They've gotten a lot of laws pushed back and defended a lot of Americans' right to keep and bear arms. NRA, um, NAGA. I mean, there's so many great gun groups that are doing great work and putting their money where their mouth is and they're putting pressure on these people because obviously we see 
the, uh, the, the legal issues with this. We see how it can be challenged. We see that it's unconstitutional. We see that it's an erosion of our rights. And of course, because of who we are, especially here at GOA, you know, we are in zero compromise to a group. So we're obviously going to go after every single thing that is could even have the inkling of being an infringement. It's basically the antithesis of the NRA, which is compromised step one, step two, every step. Uh, but the point uh, remains is that you almost wonder if perhaps maybe the people that are just going along with this uh, know what the end uh, the end goal or let's just say the end result is going to be from the very get-go and again I'm not giving anyone credit and I'm not saying that people are playing 5d chess but you almost have to wonder if even some of the rank-and-file uh, folks at the ATF are thinking to themselves Joe, this, uh, this isn't going to go anywhere. I mean, you might get a temporary relief for what you're trying to accomplish, but in the long term... But that can still help them into the polls, because remember the student loans? Vote for me, you don't have to pay them back. We're going to put them on pause. It took... And he even said, I don't, I don't have the constitutional power to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway, when it came to the re student loan relief. Or more accurately, someone else paying for your mistakes. So, he knew it wasn't going to stick, but it still was a good politically for him, because it was advantageous and got more votes. So that could also be what we're do is happening here as well. Long term, perhaps they even know uh, that the courts are gonna slap all of this down. And you, uh, you just have to wonder if maybe they're so tired of being used as a pawn in that way and not being uh, given the privilege of having to, you know, have something go through con Congress per se. Uh, maybe they even feel like, gosh, you know, maybe we should just enact all this stuff, pass every rule he wants. Yeah, throw the whole laundry list at it and then uh, the courts will throw it out. You know, it could go either way. And again, I'm not trying to give anyone credit in either direction. I'm just saying to be fair, to be unbiased in this situation, just simply just look at the reality of human behavior, the reality of who we are, the reality of our, our goals politically, whatever it may be in life, right? You have to kind of consider all of the options. And I just almost wonder if even they know and when I say they, I mean the ATF. If even the ATF knows, oh my gosh, this is just a giant cluster. Who knows? Uh, we haven't really seen a heck of a lot of enforcement action take place. I mean, now they, they've gone after some of the force reset triggers, Hypertext. which I will be discussing in a different video soon. So I won't get into a lot of detail on that. I'm going to be doing a completely new video on that particular thing. But they have uh, carried out some enforcement actions but I just fail to see the long-term success of these actions. And, uh... and I was going to say, I won't play the whole thing. It goes on for a couple more minutes. But that's also another concerning thing is selective enforcement of the law, where more often than not, it's used against you depending on your political affiliation. So when it comes to this situation, it's, oh, every gun owner should be actively, actively involved in politics because they can be turned into a criminal the day, you know, the next day and not know it inadvertently accidentally breaking the law and again legally legally speaking that's no excuse so you can get in trouble so again fervently write to your political representatives accordingly and we'll see where this certain situation where this certain scenario goes to the atf more political news you have mike pence finally qualifying for the upcoming republican debate now specifically this is for the republican primary taking place august 23rd it looks like pence campaign last monday this earlier this week they finally surpassed the requirement for having 40,000 unique donors. That is one of the requirements you need to get on the debate stage. Now, it looks like you cleared that polling threshold as well, in which you're required to have 1% in a handful of polls in terms of you have all these preliminary polls for the Republican nominee. You have to get at least 1% of a couple of those polls to also qualify for this as well. And he'll be joining the other candidates on the polls who, these are the folks who currently qualify for the debate stage. You have Trump. You have Ron DeSantis, you have Vivek, Vivek Ramaswamy, you also have Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Chris Christie, Doug Burgum. And this seems to go on and on. Now, at the end of the day, what does Mike Pence stand for? Well, he's kind of shot himself in the foot a few times in terms of the, the Trump base who really love Trump. They don't like Pence because Pence isn't as fervent at, at defending Trump as he once was. So he shot himself in the foot a couple times because there are a couple of folks where they'll never vote for him because of a couple of those political faux pas. Now, you could also argue that maybe increased some of his votes for the independents. But as of right now, that debate stays most likely won't have Trump. 
he said he probably won't do it because there's not a lot of upside. Last poll that came out, he was over, I believe, was it 27% points ahead of Ron DeSantis? Ron DeSantis polling in consistently as the number two Republican nominee. And I don't know where the... I can't help but think DeSantis is not going anywhere because he will not get chosen as a VP because strategically thinking... Like a lot of people who are running in the primaries, many of them run with... Some of them, they, they won't say this, but some of them would love to have the opportunity to be a vice president. So... And the others sometimes do because they want to uh, position, position, position on the cabinet and the other political. They, sometimes you get a job just for you know joining, so to say. But it's hard to say what is Mike Pence really standing for. I mean, he lost. He he pushed a book where he's gone on CNN, you know, condemning Trump, talking about his new book. So he alienated a lot of Republicans who don't trust CNN because CNN, you know pretty consistently biased, usually, oh, I was going to say, I shouldn't say usually, always against Trump or um, people on the right. But I can't help but think, you know, why is he running? What What is he running for? Like, what have you consistently heard him on point with a political message? It, it, I really don't see much. So I, again, he's not pulling that great either, but he did qualify. And politically speaking, it'll be interesting to see these the primary, I mean, who comes up on top? Um, maybe Vivek will come keep gaining momentum. But it'll be interesting to see, you know, does it, really, does it really matter? I mean, Trump has such a big advantage right now, but he's also being charged multiple times in multiple states. So it's a very murky situation. It'll be interesting to see what boils to the top. Now, other political news, you have Rumble ex becoming the exclusive live streamer partner for the first and second GOP debates, which from a political sphere is quite fascinating. I can't help but think when it comes to the skill set or lack of skill set like over at Fox News, I think streaming is perhaps above their intellect or pay grade. For all I know, they have a great streaming service, but they do zero advertising. But Rumble is quickly becoming a YouTube competitor. Now, they're very kind of de facto a lot of these startups in the streaming community and in the video hosting community trying to rival YouTube they're becoming political partially due to necessity partially just because of the nature of YouTube censorship an overwhelming major amount of censorship on YouTube is against conservatives and people on the right I've yet to see a famous case for someone who's left-leaning gets banned how many times has it, has it ever happened once maybe so by de facto, Google YouTube is choosing to alienate a political side of the aisle. So when you have a whole group of people who are alienated, they're going to find this new platform. They're more likely to join that platform because people on the left aren't being censored on YouTube. They really don't have a compelling reason to find a new platform because the people they like to view are still on the platform. So Rumble has become more political in that regard. It also is great because they really have, they don't censor half as much. So they actually stand for free speech, which is a rare thing in it these days as well. And it looks like in terms of how the performance is doing, they're okay. The company IPO'd with an initial public offering back, I believe, in April 2021, coming in about $9.82 per share. But I mean, even of, as of you know earlier this week, they're trading at $8.12 per share. Now, the real big issue for a lot of these streaming companies and a lot of these hosting companies is they are prohibitively expensive for the startup. You have to think of all the infrastructure. I always tell people, there's no cloud. It's just someone else's computer. When it comes to IT infrastructure, Google could absorb the cost because they're quite literally the largest tech company in history. They have whole warehouses, well, data centers more accurately, where they have racks upon racks upon racks of servers, storage, networking to host all the content that's put on there. If you're a startup, servers are expensive. And Rumble, they're not going to be able to go on AWS because AWS, also known as Amazon Web Services, where that's a service where instead of having your own hardware infrastructure, you rent someone else's. Well, they're the ones who are censoring content. So they can't safely do that. So as they're starting to build out their own, I can't help but wonder how prohibitively expensive it is. Now, from a political perspective, it's a huge achievement as a business to get that exclusivity and actually be able to participate with that live stream. And I know, you know, if you look at the demographics of the GOP, a lot of them are older, they're watching the cable. But as new people start to join that political part of the political aisle, there will be more younger people joining. And there are people who want live streams. They don't want to have, oh, I don't even have, I was going to say how many people have a cable box these days. There's probably 18 people left, don't get me wrong. But in terms of technology adoption, live streaming is quickly supplanting the previous technology of having cable boxes, 
especially as access to the internet and fast internet is increase, just increasing exponentially. So there are a lot of benefits to it and the amount of people that are rolling it out of the technology is just increasing more and more. So from this perspective, I can't help but think you know, how much more is Rumble going to grow as more and more top talent starts to join their stream platform. And even I am going to start posting out there shortly. Now, that being said, I also do t appreciate you taking time to like, share, and comment because it does help the channel grow and develop on YouTube platform as well. But we shall see. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, we have Tyson's Food closing four plants, unfortunately. And it looks like they're going to have a displacement of 2,200 jobs just about. Now, in terms of the history, and let me know in the comment section if you actually appreciate this. I'm kind of a business nerd, so I love diving, diving back into the what was, so to say. So Tyson's Foods is an American multinational corporation based over in Springfield, Arkansas, founded back in 1935. So I know math scores in the United States are all-time low in terms of public schools, so that is 88 years old. So that's a pretty well-established company, and actually the world's second largest processor and marketer of chicken, beef, and pork which are all infinitely better for you and actually more tasty than plant-based goop. Another reason not to buy Beyond Meat because it's beyond disgusting. disgusting. Pun moderately intended. Now, it looks like Tyson Food announced earlier this week that you're gonna shut down four chicken processing plants, including two in Southern Missouri. Now, the Tyson plant in Noel employs 1,500 people. And unfortunately, the mayor of the city, Mayor Tara Lance, he said, as of the 2020 consensus or census rather the city's population was about 2100 so unfortunately it's going to be detrimental to the city hopefully and again it's not like they're burning these buildings down hopefully they're able to sell it off to a third party or maybe an upstart i don't know how many upstarts there are in the meatpacking industry but hopefully someone else will be able to buy the infrastructure and re-employ the people who are displaced right now with those jobs now it looks like the closure of the plant in dexter also has a population of 7,000. this is a nine uh 900 people and that plant employs about 683 people, according to the city, which that facility was first opened by Swift Poultry Co. in the 1930s. So that's been a stable community for quite some time. And the company Tyson Foods announced that the cost cutting move was posted or was made as it posted a 417 million dollar loss for their fiscal Q uh, quarter, third quarter of the year. So it's quite disappointing and sad that a lot of these folks are going to be losing their jobs because it. It had nothing to do with their performance. You know, a lot of people are speculating our food trends just changed in the United States. People eat less chicken. A lot of people are pointing to the ever exponentially increasing cost of the components. You think of you know what makes up a chicken. You have to think of all the feed and the feed, all the costs of the. Well, I was about to say you could debate if that's an ingredient, but I was just say it's it's an input. But the cost of the feed is going up, and a lot of folks I know who they do have chickens. They keep noting when they go to even just their mom and pop tractor supply, which that's a chain, but. It has a local store feel, I would argue. Even there, the poultry prices of the actual food is, or the food that you need to feed the chickens is up. So they noted that as an increased production cost and hopefully they're able to reopen the factories. I don't know when you're such a big company and you have such a big loss, it'll be interesting to see if they're able to turn around. But unfortunately, a lot of those towns are gonna be suffering in the meantime. And I, I do hope all the jobs are quickly gained by competitors or they able to find gainful employment somewhere close in the area soon. And Tyson Foods did say that they have job openings and some of them do have closer factories. So they're encouraging everyone to apply to their internal job application on their intranet. Then hopefully they'll be able to find a different role with the company. But that is for sure the business blunder of the day. Thank you again for taking the time to tune in today. We're trying to get to 3,000 subscribers by the end of August so you can click that button. I would greatly appreciate it. Also, don't forget to take the time to like and comment. The feedback greatly appreciated and helps grow the channel. Also, and lastly, don't forget to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers. Heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe and fight the good fight.